Hi, welcome back. You just missed us uh, dancing to Abba's Dancing Queen. And Kelly failed to video it for you because she doesn't love you the way that I do. Um, so we're back to Genetics is Not Predestination Part 2. Um, I, I ended the first part by teasing that I was going to talk about socialization. So what I'm talking about, again, is these effects that we have in early life on, on dogs that can be so powerful that later on in life we look at them and we say, I didn't see a trauma happen to the dog, so surely this, this sudden behavior change that I'm seeing as the dog hits adolescence or comes out of adolescence, surely this is sort of genetically programmed. And I'm talking about a lot of the stuff that happens early on in life, even as early as in the uterus, um, that can have such powerful effects that it can really appear to be genetic. And so socialization, I always use the same photo for socialization because I just love the puppy learning um, that Kermit is, is okay and that you can sniff his crotch and he doesn't smell like a human. <laughs> so um, one part of what's happening during socialization is that your brain is wiring up. And I found this lovely picture. This is probably even still a massive oversimplification, but just showing um, all these connections that are in your brain. Uh, it's a human brain. Uh, but all these connections that the, the brain is really about passing information from one part of the brain to another part of the brain and the second part modifies it a bit and then passes it on to another part which modifies it a bit and passes it on. So the, the brain is this massive, massive network of interconnections and how those connections are laid out are, um, there's probably some effect of genetics to that but what, a lot of what makes us individual and have our individual personalities is how that brain wires up when we're really young. Um, and a lot of that happens during socialization. It obviously continues to change throughout life, um, but it's really important during socialization. And I ended the last part of this talk with the question of, well, why is it so different so in socialization? What is so different in puppy brains in those first few weeks of life that is so different in adults that it makes it so easy for them to make associations and so easy for them to generalize and so much harder for adults to do that same thing. Behavior is complicated. That's been a theme of this, um, of this conference the past few days. And so uh, once again, I'm not going to talk about dogs. I'm going to talk about cats this time. And you're going to be happy that I talk about cats until you hear what they did to the cats. This is a 1960s study. So once again, they were doing things that we would not do today. Um, but it's hard to measure behavior, right? It's hard really clearly to say, you know, we did this thing and the the wiring is different in this animal than in that animal, and it had these behavioral effects because behavior is so complicated. Vision is much more straightforward. Um, and so this, this study, I think it's from 68, looks at, uh, Huber and Weasel, I think, looks at binocular vision in cats. And so normally there is a critical period of development of binocular vision in, in animals who have two eyes. And so the brain is learning that some information is coming in through this eye and some information is coming in through that eye. And parts of the brain are wiring up to the eyes to say, I expect to get this information and then I'm going to you know, work together to, to have binocular vision with depth per perception and I'm going to understand that, that I get information from this eye or from that eye. And um, unfortunately what they did to these kittens is they sewed one eye shut during the critical period of that wiring up happening. And fascinatingly, when they unsewed the eye later on after the critical period had passed, the kittens were forever after blind in that eye, even as adults, and there was nothing wrong with the eyeball. The problem was that that period when the brain learned to listen to that eye had passed and there was uh, no ability later on to, to change those connections. It was done. Um, so we don't do this in cats anymore, but we do still do something like this in rats. So the brain, um, so I'm going to talk about exactly what's going on when this happens and I'm going to uh, sort of extrapolate from vision to behavior. Uh, so this is a neuron. Um, it's going to do a lot of processing in here in its body. It's going to think about the information that it's taken in. It has um, a lot of spots along here and some stuff reaching out. These are the, the things here, by the way, that are not as long in the hippocampus I talked about in prenatally stressed animals. So it gets information coming in here, connections from other neurons. And then that information, it decides what information it's going to send. And it sends a sort of on-off piece of information along here and out the other end. And there are helper cells, so we used to think uh, that the neurons were the thing, uh, sort of like we used to think it was all about DNA and nothing else, and then we started discovering epigenetics and other stuff. 
Um, so we used to think it was all the neurons, and now we're realizing there's actually a lot going on with these helper cells. You can see some of them here um, wrapped around uh, to help with the conduction of this electrical signal that's coming along from this neuron. So neurons and helper cells in the brain. Um, and so when the two neurons connect together, again, this is one of these, you know, I found one of these free, free pictures, and there's a bit too much going on here. But if you can see that you have one neuron here, there's its body, and it sends information off over there. You have another neuron here with its body. It's sending information here. And when this neuron connects to that neuron right there, we call that a synapse. So that's the, the connection to the two neurons. And during this period when the brain is wiring up, what's happening is that neurons are making synapses to other neurons. And um, of course, again, uh, despite having way too many labels in here and more than I really want to inflict on you, this is nevertheless a massively oversimplified system. A neuron is not going to connect to just one other neuron. They're going to connect to hundreds of other neurons or even thousands of other neurons. Uh, remember the picture of the brain that I showed early on? Just everybody's talking to everybody. It's very complex. And that, that forest of connections is what's being made early on. And so what happens when you learn something is that um, we'll start out by thinking of it as a connection between neurons, two neurons getting, getting stronger. So the connection's already there, uh, but when you learn something and the learning the thing causes this neuron to talk to this neuron, the fact that they're talking to each other makes that connection stronger. And so learning is the process of having the, this firing happen and the two neurons talking to each other over and over again. And when uh, extinction, a uh, technical term in dog training that many of you probably have heard and some of you perhaps have not, extinction being when your dog has learned something, like if I bark at the dinner table, I'll get food. And we then think we don't want the dog to do this anymore. And so we stop um, feeding the dog at the dinner table. And eventually the dog learns barking no longer gets me food. And that's the process of extinction where that learning is, is undone. And that's when the two neurons aren't talking to each other as much anymore. And so the, the synapse, the connection between the two of them gets weaker. So um, synapse is getting stronger, synapse, synapse is getting weep, weaker. That's what learning is at a very, very basic level. So during that uh, critical or sensitive period that we're talking about um, for vision or for socialization, uh, neurons are making a lot of extra synapses. So that's one of the things that happens in the baby brain. So one of the ways that the baby brain is different from the adult brain is the baby brain is just making, pr promiscuously making so many different synapses, not judging, just I'm going to connect to everything. I'm just going to reach out. I don't know what my world is like, or we talked about that. We don't know what the world is going to be like. We're going to have to figure that out. But for now, I'm going to be ready for anything. And so I'm going to connect to as many other neurons as possible. And it's chaos, right? You can't live like that your whole life. You have to make some assumptions. And so as time goes on and the baby is passing through the critical period, um, the neurons start getting pruned, the synapses start getting pruned. So it's not that the entire neuron is destroyed, it's that the connection of this neuron to this neuron hasn't been used so much. And so the brain decides, okay, this is one that's not gonna be useful in this environment. Um, this other one's useful, this is getting used all the time, so I'm gonna hang on to that. But this one, this synapse is weaker and weaker, maybe I don't need to keep it at all. And this is uh, one of the roles that those helper cells I talked about play. They actually go and they eat the synapses. Um, just like uh, immune cells will go and eat bad bacteria that are in the body, these cells will actually go eat the synapses that are so weak that the, that the brain decides it doesn't want it anymore. Um, so at, at a basic level then, what we're talking about is um, the baby brain makes lots and lots and lots of connections, possibly part of why babies are so much better at generalizing than adults gets pruned back during the socialization period. And so then at the end, that is uh, the result is the, the adult brain, different from the baby brain. And so again, we learn this story by studying vision, and it's a very difficult thing to study in uh, socialization because, again, because it's so complicated. I haven't actually seen any socialization studies in rats um, in, in the sense that we talk of socialization in dogs, um, in, the, in the sense of talking about you know, if, if the animal is not exposed to this particular stimulus like a human being, then will they be able to habituate to it later on? Um, and so it would be interesting, I, you know, I'm not encouraging anyone to do these kinds of studies in rats, but it would be interesting to, to see um, that would be one species that someone might have done something like that in. But I, I haven't been able to find them if, they're, if they exist. And of course, we don't do this kind of thing in puppies, and it's very hard to study. But, um, but the assumption is that this is exactly what's going on um, in different parts of the puppy's brain. Uh, which parts? Don't know. Um, some parts that we think are particularly important, well, I've already talked about the hippocampus uh, multiple times about how important that is 
in uh, your ability to contextualize, your ability to generalize. Um, really important things that we know that generalization is a lot easier to do during socialization, that you can meet a couple men with funny hats during your socialization period and generalize and decide that men with funny hats are okay later on. Uh, or my dog, Jenny, who really has to start fresh with everybody. She, she can meet as many men as she wants and the next one is still always gonna be scary, funny hat or not. Um, so hippocampus is probably one of those places that this is critically happening during the socialization period. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the amygdala. The amygdala is the center of where we make um, associations that have emotional content for us. So something like, um, for me, spiders are totally terrifying, right? And so that's my amygdala. I see a spider and my amygdala is reacting. And that's part of what starts that whole stress axis going. Um, for Jenny, the mail carrier, terrifying. He hasn't actually killed any of us yet, uh, but every day she's very concerned that he's going to be. Um, so for her, she'll hear the mail truck coming from several doors down and my husband and I will be like, oh, it's time to get the treats. Did you remember to get the treats? We have to get the treats because she clearly is hearing the mail truck. Um, so just that sound of the mail truck clearly is her amygdala is firing up and saying this predicts uh, a stimulus that she finds really terrifying. Um, so those are two places where I would predict that this would be happening. Again, um, this is me hypothesizing, which I love to do, and is not something that is backed by any study that I know of. So really what the puppy's doing during the socialization period then is he's selecting the best synapses. Um, the synapses that he believes are going to be relevant to him later on in his life. And he's selecting them based on which ones are getting used. And so that's what we're doing during socialization. We're trying to get the puppy to use the synapses that we want him to keep later on, right? To, to, to use that um, somewhat clumsy way of telling the brain, here's all the things that are normal. Here are the things that you should generalize. Here's what your life is gonna be like. Use those synapses now and, and keep them when you pass out of the socialization period because uh, later on it's a lot harder to make those decisions. Synapses can be strengthened and weakened later on. It's just not uh, with quite the promiscuity that happens during the socialization period. Um, a lot of people have commented that it would be really, really nice if we understood a bit more about what causes the brain to enter into this uh, promiscuous synapse making and causes it then to, to trim them back. Um, is it possible then that we could take some dogs like Jenny and put them back into the socialization period, socialize them properly and take them back out of it? I don't know that we're that close to that. Some people have hypothesized that uh, behavioral medications like SSRIs um, can help the brain do that. I don't think we really know exactly what SSRIs do. Uh, we know some, some very specific things that they do, but not exactly what, how that affects the brain. Um, Jenny is on behavioral medication and it has helped her quite a bit. All right, so we keep getting these questions and I keep promising to answer them about how does environment interact with genetics and what do we mean when we say that the environment interacts with genetics. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk now about some stuff that happens with puppies very early on in life when they're still in the nest um, or when they first start coming out of the nest and generally before they come home. So really little puppies um, show decreased fear and a decreased cortisol response. And this was a, a really interesting paper that came out in 2015, and they had this uh, lovely video attachment to it that um, they, their novel stimulus was this wind-up duck or electronic duck. And so um, it was a, a Yorkie puppy that they had the example videos with. And they had this little Yorkie puppy who was so young that he wasn't at this stage yet where he was gonna start showing fear of novel items, and they show this duck, you know, being freakish, and the, the puppy's just like. And then they show a puppy just a couple weeks later, and the duck makes the first noise, and the puppy's like, just like so fast he's out of there. It's a very short video. Um, so it's just a beautiful illustration of when they're that young, and a lot of us don't interact with puppies that are that young because they're still at the breeder. Um, but puppies that are that young do show this decreased fear and their, uh, their levels of cortisol aren't going up when they're having these stimuli. And so as a result, socialization during this time, so they start leaving the nest, moving away from their mom at around four weeks, and their fear response starts kicking in somewhere between five to seven weeks. And that chunk of time, so I just talked about how their brain is making a lot of associations, right? But remember that during the socialization period, those, those associations, they're very powerful 
but they can be either good or bad, and so it's very easy to traumatize a dog long term during the socialization period. But the nice thing about this very early bit, while they're still with the breeder presumably, is that they're not showing the fear response yet, which means during those first few weeks, puppies are primed to accept what they see as normal and to not have a bad association to it, which means that those first few weeks are enormously powerful for, um, for socializing puppies. After that, you have to be very careful to make sure that they have a, a, a good interaction with somebody. And uh, plenty of people have mourned how they overdid it with their puppy and they thought it would be fine taking this puppy into this crowd of people and it was too, mu too much for him and they really feel that that was a damaging thing that they did during this, this very powerful socialization period. Um, I, I'm, and I'm not saying to take four-week-old puppies to football games, but I am saying <laughs> that this is a time um, when they are, they are really primed for things not to scare them, and so it's a very powerful time for them, and you can see how adaptively it's, it's a perfect time for them. They're, they're first leaving the nest, um, but their mom is still probably keeping them in pretty close. They're probably in a pretty safe environment, and their brains are super primed for them to say, everything that I see here is normal. Um, which is a, a, a good thing for them to presume at that point. So the other thing that this 2015 paper looked at, uh, which is really interesting, is that this onset of fear, when the puppy first shows this fearful response to the terrifying quacking duck, and when his cortisol levels start rising, it happens at a different age in different breeds, um, showing the suggestion that there may be some sort of genetic effect on when the socialization period, if you want to say begins or ends or whatnot, but when that, that early, very powerful socialization time closes. Um, they looked at three breeds. They looked at, as I said, uh, Yorkshire Terriers. They looked at German Shepherds and they looked at Cavaliers. And I have the picture of just the Shepherd and the Cavalier here because these are the ones that were the most different. The German Shepherds started showing fear at five weeks of age, so just one week after they came out of the nest. Um, the Cavaliers at seven weeks of age. The Cavaliers had two more weeks of having uh, the ability to interact with things uh, without really having a fear response on board. Incredibly powerful. Um, and there's some work being done by Catherine Lord in our lab to continue to look at what these differences are in different breeds. This is very early, uh, early work. And so I get a lot of questions like, well, what about my breed? What, what's the age at my breed? Uh, we're still trying to figure it out. But the, the really important takeaway for me here is that this is one of the ways in which environment and genetics interact is that genetics can probably have um, a strong influence because it's, it's based on breeds, right? Um, so we think that it's probably genetic, a strong influence on, on the length of your socialization period. And then your environment will certainly be you know, how you're actually socialized. So I would say you know, German Shepherds um, have a reputation for being aloof. I went and took a look at the breed standard, which says that they should not um, readily make friends upon first contact. Uh, Cavaliers, on the other hand, are bred to be lapdogs. So is this part of the biological explanation for why these two breeds are so different? Uh, you know, we don't know that for sure, but it, it seems like a really good story. And then I promised some people on Facebook that I would talk a little bit about the tame foxes. So this is me in Siberia. This is a tame foxling, a uh, little kit. He was about five weeks old. I had gone to draw blood from them um, just, at that, just in that age when they were first starting to venture out of the nest and uh, when they were too young to start showing fear. The, for those of you who don't know, this is a, an ongoing, many decades long project um, in Novosibirsk, uh, Siberia, Russia where these foxes have been um, very, very strongly selected either to be very friendly and tame towards humans or very fearful and aggressive towards humans. And uh, Dr. Ballantyne talked uh, last in, in, in her talk about how, you know, we like to say that genetics is just about risk, it's about our predisposition, but it's not generally about pre-programming. But she talked about those nervous pointers and how, um, First of all, uh, they were able to change the, the behavioral phenotype of those animals in just a few generations. And secondly, about how those animals really did seem to be pre-programmed, about how they really were fearful and there wasn't much you could do about it um, environmentally. And that is the case with the tame and the aggressive foxes. They have changed the environments of the tame foxes and the aggressive foxes. They've had aggressive foxes raise the tame foxes. And there's no overlap. The most aggressive of the tame foxes is still tamer than the least aggressive of the aggressive foxes always. And it doesn't matter what environment they're in. Um, so this is, again, when you have very, very strong selection, this is not something that we expect to see in our pet population. But it, it makes for good research. And, and this is the population that I worked with for my PhD. Um, 
So the interesting thing then is that, and this, this particular project is not what I worked on, but it is a really interesting fact about these foxes is that the tame foxes, um, well, I should say the aggressive foxes do show this onset of fear. Oh, I don't remember exactly, but it is similar to dogs because um, they do it in days instead of weeks. There's a, a date at which they show their onset of fear, and the tame foxes show their onset of fear much later. And um, some of them don't appear to ever really show an onset of fear at all. There's a fair amount of variation actually in the tame population, and so some of them are a bit nervous and fearful, um, but they, they get over it very quickly, particularly for animals who haven't been extensively socialized with humans. Um, but some of them apparently are quite fearless um, and can be subjected to all kinds of challenges, and they're just fine with it. Um, so again, here there may, this may be part of the biological difference between the two different kinds of personalities developed by these two different lines of foxes. Does it have to do with the socialization period that the aggressive foxes have this much shorter period of time before their onset of fear for them to learn what's normal and the tame foxes a much, much longer period of time? So this period that I'm talking about before uh, fear shows up, we call the stress hypo-responsive period because it's a period in which the animal is not very responsive, hypo-responsive to stress. And it appears to be, um, just for those of you who want to nerd out for a second, who are curious about the biological mechanism, I was curious for a long time, and I finally found this 1986 paper by my hero, Robert, Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who's a famous neuroendocrinologist in which um, he describes a mechanism that he believes explains it. I don't know if it's the whole explanation. Um, it's the off switch, he thinks. And so we talked about how the hippocampus has receptors that, that look for cortisol. And so you get scared and the cortisol comes and uh, binds to the receptors and the hippocampus says, okay, that's enough, time to turn off. And it seems that in this period when the HP axis doesn't really turn on, it's because the uh, hippocampus is hyper, hyper responsive to cortisol. It's because normally um, cortisol is um, carried by this protein in the blood. And so there can be a fair amount of it in the blood before the protein lets go of enough of it for the hippocampus to see it. The liver doesn't make that protein during this stress hyporesponsive period. And so although the same amount of cortisol may be being released at sort of baseline, um, there's more of it in the blood, and so the hippocampus sees it much more readily. And so the hippocampus appears to be in this constant state of, oh my God, there's plenty of cortisol. Don't, for love of God, do not turn on the stress response. We're all set here, um, even though they're not all set. So that appears to be what's going on. It's another thing that I would love to look at is um, uh, making of that protein in the liver. Um, why do different dogs perhaps do it at different times? Is this the same in dogs as it is in rats? Um, I don't know, but it's just such an interesting mechanism to me. And I also love the idea that the liver <laughs> could be part of what's responsible for the beginning or the ending of the socialization period. I think that's fascinating. Um, yeah, I guess a lot of this talk for you guys is just going to be, I don't know, I think this is what it's going to be, and hopefully we'll learn it someday. So I don't know. Um, so we don't really know if the timing, if this difference in the onset of, the, of this hyperreactive period affects personality as an adult. So we've so far we've been looking at the differences between breeds. A study I'd really love to see done is looking at individuals, perhaps within a breed. Um, right now it's, it's kind of hard because you want ex to expose the dog to something novel. And so you have to keep finding something novel and eventually they get um, inured to novelty in general. Um, so it's, it's a difficult experiment to do. And so as a result, we tend to just test once a week um, to make it easier. Um, but it'd be nice, I think, to pin down day by day uh, when at a much finer grained level when it actually happens in a particular litter um, or a, a bunch of different individuals within the same breed and then to follow those individuals through their lives. And uh, once they are adults, you know, when they're sort of two or three years old, then look at them and see um, do some of them have uh, more fearful personalities than others? Uh, was socialization more effective in some than others? Uh, super difficult project to do, right? Uh, among other things, obviously, how they're socialized is going to be a major factor. You want them to be in pet homes, so it's just going to be different. So you'd have to have a lot of dogs, but it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, so I haven't found anyone who's willing to help me do it yet, uh, but I hope someday. So we don't really know if within a breed this has uh, effects in individuals. Um, but as I said, that we, so we've been looking at it across breeds, and it does seem so far to hold true 
that if the onset of fear is earlier, then it's one of those breeds that has a reputation for, in general, being less friendly. But again, uh, one of the things we've talked about here is that you know, breeds are not monolithic. There are a lot of differences within breeds. Uh, dogs are individuals within breeds. Some German Shepherds are quite friendly. Um, and so I don't know what, what influence this has at the individual level, and I would be super curious to find out. So hopefully we'll figure out how to do this at some point. Um, but on, on that note, I wanted to talk about some really fascinating research that's going on in Carlson Lab right now. So Dr. Catherine Lord, um, I think, is really one of the, the forerunners of studying uh, dog socialization, the dog socialization period, and the wolf socialization period. Um, she would want me to say the critical period. And uh, she did some fascinating work during her PhD mapping out some really interesting differences between the dog socialization period and the wolf socialization period. What she's working on with us right now, um, I, I was asked and, and promised to talk a little bit more about some new epigen epigenetics work. And so she's looking at differences during the socialization period at sort of the same ages between dogs and wolves, um, looking at cells in the, in the mouth and in the saliva to see if we can see differences in gene expression. And the gene expression, as I said, that's related to epigenetics. That's epigenetic markers are telling the, the cell, this is the part of the DNA. These are the genes that you should be expressing right now. So the theory is that um, at a particular time, uh, you know, dog puppies will start expressing some particular genes more. And then wolf puppies will also express those particular genes more, but perhaps at a different time. And that we'd be able to start seeing changes that, you know, oh, this one goes up at this week, and this one goes up at this week. And we'll start getting some, um, some insights that will explain everything, of course. Um, this is very, very early days, and we're still figuring it out. Particularly, we're still figuring out the technology uh, to actually look at this uh, gene expression differences. And um, the other thing is, of course, we're using saliva. Uh, it'd be great if we could use, you know, like hippocampus biopsies. But again, that's a little uncomfortable for the dogs and the wolves, so we don't do it. Um, Catherine uh, has access to some wolf puppies. I was not able to help her out with that because she doesn't love me enough. But she did let me help with the corgi puppies. Corgi puppies at this age are little caterpillars. They don't really have legs at all, pretty much. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do after exposing them to the novel item to see if their fear response had turned on yet is we wanted to measure their cortisol. And we wanted to do that from, from urine, which is a, a great way to do it. Um, but you normally with a girl dog, when it pees, it sort of squats a little bit. But if you haven't got legs, then it's really hard to tell if you're squatting. And so there was just a lot of us with Petri dishes, because that was all we could fit under them, being like, is it doing it? Is it doing it? No, it's not. No, I think it is. I think it is. Put it under there. And finally, this one grad, stu the grad student that we had, who hadn't been with our lab for very long, but who had a lot of dog experience, said, OK, take them out of the crate and put them on this tarp. And then when they pee on the tarp, use a syringe to suck the pee up. And we were like, brilliant. So that was what we did. Um, for those of you who want to do uh, work with eight-week-old corgi puppies, I highly recommend the tarp and syringe approach. <laughs> OK. So we talked about. Um, so we talked about uh, mild stress in the uterus and how that can be good. Um, a lot of the breeders who are listening hopefully are already, uh, already know about early neural stimulation. So something that the breeder of my dog did and was, was uh, something that I absolutely wanted the breeder of my dog to do, um, even though we don't really know <laughs> if it works. Um, but it seems like it's a good idea, and so we all do it in the hopes that, that it works. And this is from uh, a military, Department of Defense research. Um, trying to make super dogs. They call it the super dog program or the biosensor program. I think this was in the 50s or 60s. I could be wrong about that. Um, and so they developed a protocol for exposing very, very small puppies before they leave the nest to, um, to mild stress. And so we like to say we're annoying the puppies. Um, and the idea is that the puppy would learn early on there's some mild challenges in life, but I can overcome them and it'll make a very resilient dog. They didn't publish their results. And so we presume that they must have done a randomized controlled trial and that they have solid results. But the military is not big on publishing those sorts of things. So we don't actually know if it worked. We do have this one paper, Patalia 2009, which outlines um, their protocol. I presume it's the same protocol that was used in their study. I don't know that for sure. And I, I believe that that is basically the protocol that breeders are using these days, although I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not a breeder, and I'm not tightly tied into that community. Uh, but so here you can see the, the puppy's toes being tickled. 
Um, and so they do things like tickle the puppy's toes and hold the puppy um, upside down, head down, and put a sort of a cold washcloth on the puppy's toes and things like that. And that starts at about three days of age. So it's very, very early stimulation. So this kind of mild stress we think is good, right? We think that, again, that annoyance and learning to overcome the puppy, the problems, is good for the puppy. And, and you think about stories like singleton puppies growing up to have self-control problems because they haven't had to overcome the challenges of like fighting off their brothers and sisters for the nipples. So again, these are all sort of anecdotal, makes sense. We think it's probably a thing. Uh, but a lot of readers do this, and I absolutely support it. I think it's a really good idea. Um, but too much stress is absolutely a bad thing, and a lot of these studies have been done in humans. We've looked at um, human children who've had severe stress, um, childhood abuse of some sort usually, and then we look at them as adults and we can see that there are um, significant changes in their personality, in the, the likelihood of becoming depressed, in their amount of resilience against other trauma, so their likelihood of developing PTSD as, adu as, a, as adults, very, very strongly affected by early life stress. But really interestingly, so getting back to this interaction between genetics and environment, they appear, um, some of these studies have shown that they appear to have to have a genetic risk factor. So if you have the risk factor and you don't have the early life stress, you're fine. Um, if you have the early life stress and you don't have the risk factor, you're resilient and you deal with it. But if you have the genetic risk factor and the early life stress, then you are at greater risk later on for things like developing depression or PTSD. Um, so I, I promised you a figure, a really nerdy figure. So this is what we call gene by environment interaction. And I'm just gonna walk you through this. This uh, is we like to have something very simple. So this is not about behavior. Um, this is about uh, body size. Um, so on this axis down here, we have a creature that is small. Up here, we have a creature that is large. On this axis, we have temperature. So here we have the creature living in a warm environment. Here we have the creature living in a cold environment. And then we have two different um, genetic backgrounds. We'll assume it's a single gene, who knows? Um, so uh, red gene, uh, black gene. So here we have no variation. Um, the body size doesn't change depending on what environment the animal is in. Gets a little bit more interesting here um, where the environment that you're in doesn't matter, but the, the gene does have uh, an effect. And so this is a straightforward genetic variation. The animals with this black gene are gonna have larger body size than the animals with the red gene. Here, the environment matters, so you're gonna be larger if you're in the cold environment, but the gene doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you have the red or the black gene. You're gonna to respond to the environment in exactly the same way. Here, they both matter, but still not an interaction. Um, because you're always going to be larger in the cold environment. If you have the black gene, you're going to be even larger, but the difference is the same, right? So it's, it's like that. So here's where it gets interesting. So over here, if you're in the warm environment, um, there's no effect, you're the same size. If you're in the cold environment, this red gene, the, the red gene animal is still the same size, but the black gene animal suddenly has an effect. Right? So here, the genetics and the environment are interacting. And you can tell that because there's a different slope of the two lines they would cross. Eventually, that's the trick to look for. Even more interesting here, in the warm environment, the red gene animal is smaller and the black gene animal is larger. But suddenly, in the cold environment, the black gene animal is smaller and the red gene animal is larger. So this is what we call a, a gene by environment interaction. And that is exactly what I'm talking about in the terms of behavior, the human studies with PTSD. So if you have the normal allele, and this is a gene that has been uh, studied recently called FKBP5. Don't worry about the name of it, but if you wanted to know more, that's what she would look up. And I have a, a paper for you there. If you have the normal allele and no trauma, you're not gonna develop PTSD. Why would you? You haven't had any trauma. If you have a uh, normal allele and childhood trauma, um, you're still not going to develop uh, PTSD because you have the normal allele, which is not providing the genetic risk. If you have the risk allele and no trauma, still no trauma, you're okay. Uh, but the problem is when you have the risk allele and you have childhood trauma, then as an adult, you're at greater risk of developing PTSD. So that is a genetic by environment interaction. And uh, I hope you guys who find this unclear will ask lots of questions about it on Twitter. So genetics and environment are both super important then, and they interact in the development of personality. And it's, it's a difficult concept really to get uh, your head through it. I don't think anyone really understands it. It's, it's really very much what I'm interested in and what, I, and what I study. And I still, I feel like every day or every week, I, I come across some new piece of information and I start conceptualizing 
it to myself in a different way. Um, but it's, it's very much that, as I said at the beginning of my first, the first part of my talk, that the brain has a lot of different directions it could go in, right? And so it starts heading off in one direction. And maybe you think of it as the, the genetics start you in, in one direction. And then it's just getting sort of buffeted a little bit um, in different directions by experience. And so early on, these very, very small, um, very small effects of environment or of experience can have massive effects, sort of like if I'm going from here and flying out to Mars, you know, I have to get my direction perfect because if I change just that much, I'll miss Mars by millions of miles, right? But if I'm almost there, I'm going to hit it. Mars is pretty big. It's no big deal. Um, and so just that, that early on thing can be so important. And, um, and so that is, that is my story for those of you who say, you know, it, this, this behavioral problem appeared suddenly. I don't know why she has this behavior problem. I, I never saw any trauma. You know, she's afraid of other dogs, but no other dog ever did anything scary to her. Or, well, you know, there was one time, but it was really minor, and she seemed just fine afterwards. But, you know, we don't know what the dog's experience is. We don't know how the dog experienced that particular thing. And we don't know if the dog had massive other experiences that were very important to them that you couldn't perceive. I mean, I haven't even talked about littermate interactions, right? But there's all kinds of stuff that goes on in the uterus, um, early on in the nest, uh, before the breeder is even really interacting with the dog, um, and then early on during the socialization period before you take the dog home, and then still during the socialization period when you're doing all your excellent socialization during that first month that you have the dog. All of that is working together, and it's working together in super complex ways. And so you can't really say in an individual that something is 20% genetics and 80% environment. Because it's, it's not like a, um, you know, a thermometer that you fill up so much and the genetics provides this much fearfulness and the environment provides this much fearfulness. It really is this pathway of development that the brain is following. And genetics is bumping you like this and environment is bumping you like that. And then environment bumps you like this, but oh, genetics changes that. So in some people it goes like this, but because of genetics it goes like that in other people. It's just super complicated. Um, and, and we are very much early on in our understanding of what's going on. It's this amazingly complex system, which I find just fascinating, uh, and yet sometimes so frustrating, because I feel like we're just at this point where we're starting to realize that this, this huge chasm is opening up in front of us, and we're like, oh, we thought that we were just going to do a GWAS and, and find five genes, and we would find the gene for aggression and the gene for fear, and we'd be done. And we really did sort of think this kind of thing um, about 20 years ago. And now, and then we started thinking, oh, it's just going to be more genes, or maybe more genes than that. And now we're starting to realize just the depth of the importance of epigenetics and early life experience and how all of this stuff interacts in these crazy, crazy ways. Um, so just that quick list for you, for those of you who want a summary of what I talked about. Um, stress in the uterus is important. Uh, reproductive hormone exposure in the uterus is important. How the mom uh, interacts with the baby is important. There's going to be other experiences in the nest, and there's going to be other experiences out of the nest. All super important in, in affecting adult personality and may all be so powerful that they may appear to be genetic. Um, although, again, as with Jenny, not necessarily unchangeable. Just because it's powerful and hard to change doesn't mean that um, continuing to work with the dog gradually and slowly over many years, and she continues to improve. It amazes me. She, um, she's been with me for about six and a half years now, and I keep thinking, surely we're done. Surely she will plateau. And I tell all my veterinary behavior friends, and they're all so happy to hear, she continues to improve. She is better now than she was a year ago. She can take treats from a total stranger who has just entered the house now. She has learned that once the stranger throws the first treat, she says, oh, it's the treat game. I understand that game. And she is able to do that now. And she was not able to overcome her fear only a year ago to do that. So she's just continuing to change. So keep working with those dogs. Um, some, some recommendations for you. Start socializing as soon as the puppy leaves the nest. Um, so this is for the breeders among you, I guess, um, or for people who adopt the super young puppies or are fostering super young puppies from shelters. Um, it's so important, right? They leave the nest around four weeks, and you have that sort of two to three weeks of just that really, really powerful time, and that's a really powerful time to start socializing. But don't stop afterwards. They're still learning a lot. You just have to be a bit more careful. Oh, well, you should always be careful to make sure that the experiences are really good. Um, mild stress, probably a good thing, particularly if you provide strong support. Letting the puppy overcome some challenges with your support and see that, oh, I did it. You know, I had to, to try and I did it and it's good. 
Um, you know, keeping them wrapped in cotton is not going to teach them how to overcome challenges in the world. But too much is a bad thing. Do not take your puppy to a baseball game early on and expect it to be just fine. Um, that would be extreme stress. Breed animals with mild stress responses, we've talked about that previously. Someone on Twitter commented that this was probably the most important takeaway for him, and I retweeted that. I think that's so important. You don't know, right? So I'm talking about how we don't know whether this stuff is genetic or not. So you get these animals with mild stress responses. Maybe it's genetic and it's easy to pass on. Maybe it's not genetic, but maybe it's going to be passed on through maternal care. So an animal with um, a heightened stress response, a fearful animal, I find it so important that these animals not be bred. Use good moms, not bad moms for breeding. If you breed your dog and the dog is just terrible with the puppies, we still don't really know what good maternal care is uh, in a really detailed way. But if the mom just doesn't spend any time with the puppies, doesn't care for the puppies, and you're doing a lot of the work, don't breed that mom again. Um, the, the mom's contribution is super important to the puppies. And, and that's just not those that, that care is, is necessary. And that's an important thing that you can give those puppies as a good mom. Um, so when you're going to a breeder and you're asking them questions when you're choosing whether they're a good breeder for you, how do they socialize their puppies? How early do they start? Does it sound like they understand that mild stress is important and too much stress is bad? Um, how does the mom interact with the puppies? Has she had puppies before? How did the other puppies turn out? Does she seem to enjoy the puppies? Is she getting away from the puppies as early as possible? If you're going to a shelter, was the puppy an orphan or did she have an actual mom? Was the mom in the shelter? Was the mom fostered? Was the puppy in the shelter? Was the puppy fostered? How experienced was the foster mom? And did the foster mom do a good job at socializing the puppy? And of course, if the answers to, to some of these scare you, it doesn't mean that I'm saying you shouldn't adopt that dog from a shelter, but I'm just saying you should be aware that these are, um, these are important questions to at least be aware of as you're going into things. And if you are running a shelter, hmm, things to think about. So that's it for me. Um, I tweet a lot and I talk on Facebook a lot about dog science. And so if you like knowing what the stories that are floating around in the interwebs are about dog science, I recommend that you follow me uh, because I will find them and I will share them with you. Um, so that's it. That's all I've got for you. And I will see you in just a few minutes for the Q&A. If any of this was difficult, please tweet the questions and I'm more than happy to answer.